I am now recording and just wanted to say my name is Mike Lagerquist. I work with Vine Faith in Action and we are currently at the, or I am currently at the Arts Center of St. Peter. I've got uh, Ann Rosenquist Fee or Ann Fee here is the executive director and she is going to take us on a virtual tour of the facility here in St. Peter, give us a little background information about the history or the art center and talk a little bit about what they're doing to accommodate the, the strange times that we're in. So uh, I am going to step to the other side of this screen or kind of plexiglass that's here. And then I will turn the camera around and I see you can see Anne there. So. And I can't see you. So I'll rely on Mike to raise his hand when someone has a question or something. All right, um, take it away, Anne. How many vi visitors, how many virtual visitors do we have? Because I'm going to count it on my counter. Uh, I think we've got nine. Oh, excellent. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, plus me. Okay, wonderful. That counts because that's all we've got right now. Um, well, welcome, everybody. Uh, the Art Center opened back up in mid-June. Uh, after being shut down, of course, for quarantine. And um, we decided that the best way to reopen was not with a single artist exhibiting because we just didn't know what uh, the community would do. We didn't know if people would want to come in, how they'd feel coming in. So we thought it best to um, kind of distribute the burden and uh, take that risk of reopening with the, um, our annual membership show. So that's what we did. We opened in mid-June and instead of a two-day work collection period, we had uh, two weeks where we invited our members to come in. And usually that's, it's a really nice time. It's like a reunion. Uh, we have about 40 artists who participate. Um, did not know what was going to happen this year. What happened was more than 60 artists came in and there are 100 total pieces, which is more than we have ever had uh, as part of our, you know, part of our member exhibition. And uh, that was wonderful. Uh, everyone was well behaved, I'll say. Everybody who came into the Art Center was masked and this was before uh, that was a statewide requirement. It was just a sign that we put up and we were hoping people would comply. They did. Uh, and then the same has continued during the exhibition as we've been open for July and August with this, this wonderful show up. Everybody in has been um, patient and just so grateful to be in a place where they can feel connected to humans in a way that's different than social media. It's just a little more real life and authentic, and yet it's safe. I mean, at the Arts Center anyway, there are never um, dense crowds of people. You never, you're, that's right, Mike just lost our <laughs> ability to swipe a card, but I, if anyone needs to buy anything on the, on the spot, we can work that out without the swiper. Uh, but anyway, it's just become a really wonderful gathering place without being an actual like gathering of, of large groups of people. And uh, our docent staff who stays right here behind this desk, they're, they're back in action after some time away. I'm behind this desk quite a bit and it is doing my soul just wonders to have people come in, experience the art and just feel connected to each other when we um, we need it more than ever. And uh, so that's been a nice surprise how things have worked. So um, I can show you some yes. of the pieces. Oh yeah, is there a question? Ah, no, somebody oh. sneezed, I oh, believe. Oh, bless you. But, but, it, but it's a good time to say that uh, because I can't necessarily uh, see the chat room, if you do have any questions, and Anne has, has graciously said she will answer whatever questions you have, just please uh, speak up and we can take care of them right at that, at that time. Okay. All right. All right, well, I'll point out just a couple of things. Again, this is an exhibition with 100 pieces. So we'll go through a few of them upstairs and a few of them downstairs. If anything catches your eye, let Mike know and we can go into more detail. But I wanna point out a couple of things that are, um, that are specific to the times we're in. Uh, it's always interesting to hang the membership show because again, it's 60 different artists. So it's not like it's necessarily cohesive when all the work shows up, right? So there are a lot of decisions to be made about how to arrange things that feel like they have a flow. Um, and in, in the time that we're in now, there was a question for us of how to arrange things that um, amplify, amplify and emphasize voices that don't, nor, like, don't ordinarily get to take center stage. It just feels like 
um, uh, it's our job to try to do that in any way that we can, including the fact that uh, quarantine has shed some light on economic disparities and we want to be able to lift up artists who are working with really simple materials, maybe at the beginning of their artistic career versus, you know, polished, framed, perfect stuff at the end. So along those lines, one of the things we invested in, it seems like a small thing, but it feels like a big thing for us. One of the things we invested in were these, was this hanging system um, that is magnets. So this artist is um, Jeremy Berger. He's an art teacher and a football coach in Mankato. And, or no, I'm sorry, not an art teacher. He is a football coach and PE teacher in Mankato. And he does art um, out of, you know, personal passion, hopes to, uh, hopes to grow that career with grants and exhibitions and things like that. He doesn't right now have the means or the time to frame work like this uh, professionally. And um, we invested in this magnet system to make it look as professional and finished as the more, uh, the more experienced artist pieces on, on either side of it. And our hope is that going forward, we can do that to make other artists who are at the beginning of their careers working you know, with found or uh, inherited materials, uh, we can make their stuff look just as good and inspire them, them uh, to keep going. So that's one thing. Over here. Um, one wonderful thing about the membership show is it is artists on all ends of the spectrum. So over there we had, you know, Jeremy's work uh, he's at the beginning of his career. This is Brian Holland, who is a working artist in St. Peter, who makes his living uh, making and selling wildlife art like this. This piece is uh, called Prophecy, Oil and Mixed Media. It's $1,620. And um, that's the higher end of work that's for sale in this show. You'll also find, you know, the ceramic piece for, for $50 and and things much cheaper than that. Um, but Brian is a staple of, of Art Center member shows and I think people enjoy seeing an artist of this caliber always showing uh, in our annual membership show. Uh, this piece is obviously particularly timely. It's gotten a lot of attention uh, during this exhibition and the, the artist is Margie Lazor. And she's a member of uh, the group of artists who has gotten together every Monday morning for about 20 years uh, as part of our drawing group. And right now they're meeting in the pavilion. We're supposed to meet this morning, actually, I was gonna model, but they got rained out. Um, and they meet and draw and sketch and compare notes on their artwork every Monday. And then occasionally something comes out of it that's a piece that is a finished piece uh, like this. I don't know if this started with a sketch in the drawing group. It's called COVID Nightingale. Um, I think it's stunning. I'd be really surprised if it didn't sell by the end of this exhibition. Uh, and Margie, it's been a pleasure to watch her really grow her skills over the years as part of that group to be able to do something that's as expressive and powerful as that. We're also seeing a lot of landscapes in this member exhibition and that speaks to a lot of artists going on what they've called like, you know, quarantine walkarounds. That's a, a park in St. Peter, that is Sarah Leadholm, who's an artist who you've probably seen. Uh, you've seen her work over the years. She's a, a staple of the St. Peter and Greater Mankato art scene. And right next to it is a piece by Charlie Putnam, who is our next solo exhibiting artist. His solo exhibition was scheduled for April. So he was right smack in the middle of shutdown and was just uh, whiplashed all around in terms of, you know, could we open? Uh, should we postpone it a year? Uh, so in that kind of frenzied time when he was in limbo, not knowing what was going to happen, he made a whole bunch of quarantine related work. So uh, in, let's see, September and October, uh, we moved him to that spot. He will be doing a solo exhibition that is a lot of work like this with a lot of masks, maps, uh, things that represent feeling trapped and, and mm -hmm. isolated and yet really whimsical. Uh, and also Charlie is our first answer to what to do about receptions because we can't have in-person receptions right now with cheese and cracker tables. It's just not advisable for a lot of reasons, including that our volunteers who, who manage receptions are all women in their mid seventies and they are not interested in coming and being exposed to each other and to the public. 
So we are taking advantage of a unique opportunity that we have in that we have um, a KMSU radio studio here at the Art Center. So for the month of the months of September and October, Charlie will be my guest on my Thursday show uh, for eight weeks of in-depth interviews, music that inspires him, music that somehow plays into his exhibition. And our hope is that that will engage people in a different way. They'll be able to listen to that, also come to the gallery when it's you know not busy. Uh, and so they can digest all that together, kind of what Charlie says, two months of, of his work on the walls, and maybe it'll even be a cooler, more in-depth experience than your usual reception in a one-month show. So, Mike, anything catch your eye that you want to Well, about? shoot, I just, I just turned it off. Hang on, folks. Sorry, shut off the power by mistake here. So, uh, well, I was wondering, can everybody hear me all right? Okay, I was wondering about this piece because I think I've seen that one before. Is that a Margie Lazor? It is a Margie Lazor. It's another Margie Lazor. And I'm not sure, but I'm suspecting that she might be one who goes to, um, in the past, of course, local performances by, um, what is her name? Betty, I can't remember her last name. Uh, Betty Harzma, who does um, aerial fitness and shows okay. and things like that. There, it's, it's a wonderful opportunity to sketch uh, artists in almost like a live model situation or life drawing situation. So I'm guessing that that's where that came from. That so, did not, that was not a pose at the drawing group. She right. and Margie Larson had an exhibit on our yeah, fifth floor. That's right. I think it was there. I think we have some Margie Larson here as well. Yeah. All right. Do you want to talk a little bit about, as I see we're coming up to the gallery shop. The gallery shop. Do you yeah, want to talk well, how that plays into your... I will talk about it being rearranged. Yeah, so the gallery shop is um, a pottery by a lot of people who make work in our clay studio, which is just through the windows there. And uh, everything that's sold in here is local. The artist, um, pottery is, is usually, like I said, in our studio, but then the jewelry, uh, uh, woodwork, all that other stuff is just artist home studios. It's all people with day jobs who just do this work as their passion. So we don't buy it from them outright. When people buy from the gallery shop, we, um, we collect 30% and we send 70% of the commission check to the artists every quarter. So it helps them and it particularly helps them right now when there are no opportunities for summer sales. Mm -hmm. So that gets to another new thing we're doing. We usually feature uh, about 25, these artisans and more, for about 25 artisans for a one day event in November out at the treaty site. And we also sell Lepsa and have a bake sale. It's called our holiday fair. Uh, six to 800 people attend every year. Can't do that right now, just like receptions for a whole bunch of reasons. It's just not, not advisable. So what we're going to do is basically explode the gallery shop into the mm -hmm. art center for a three month period. We're calling it our holiday market. So it'll be October, November, December, and we'll have a different theme um, every two and a half weeks or so. So like the first block will be photography and prints, and then it'll be jewelry and wearables. And so what you would experience in a one day event at Holiday Fair, you can stroll through here a few times during the holiday mm -hmm. shopping season and be able to buy work, support those artists, get your gifts, you know, purchased if you're interested in buying local art as gifts and not have exposure to, to large crowds. And the artists won't be here. They're just giving their stuff to us in advance. We'll set it up a lot like this, but again, throughout the gallery. Um, and again, that's a way to support them when they have few other sales opportunities right now. Okay. So here's our fancy COVID signage, one shopper. Oh. I'll try to avoid the hanging exhibit here. Yeah, I don't know how well this shows. The hanging is, is by a young artist in St. Pierre, Mary Traxler, who spent a lot of time during quarantine um, walking the river and cleaning it up. I would often see her on her way back with like a bag full of garbage. So uh, that's what this is inspired by and that's what these pieces are, are all mm. pieces from her nature slash junk collection walks. How many square feet to, do you have for gallery space? It's a very good question. I don't know the answer okay. to that. I can find that for you. 
This is a piece by our board president, uh, Emily Stark, who's a member of the governor. She's a professor at MSU in the psychology department, just really active in all kinds of creative work. And one of the ways she entertained herself during quarantine was um, uh, she cleared out the governor's closing thrift store stash of uh, stuffed animals and doll heads. And then she went around town in kind of creepy settings and just photographed the doll heads. And she has almost entirely transitioned her landscape photography business to be landscapes and creepy doll heads. <laughs> and uh, so she posted a lot of these on Facebook and we joked about it being an, an exhibition piece. And she decided to do it, to go ahead and do it and, that, and to tilt it in a way that references our kind of warpy tilted world right now. And you know, there are a few pieces like COVID Nightingale is one of them, a um, few pieces that really literally reference the, the moment that we're in. But I think if you spend time looking at this exhibition, almost everything that was created in the past few months certainly uh, shows a certain kind of warpiness of playing with perspective. Um, maybe on the other side of the spectrum, a search for, a search for comfort. Um, and which is why I think when people come through here, they're feeling a sense of togetherness that um, doesn't require people being in the same room uh, mm. at the same time. So here's another one. Um, this is by Edie Schmierbach, who is a longtime artist and member here at the Art Center. Uh, she usually does really beautiful charcoal and pencil drawings for a member show. This is something really different with, um, uh, again, just like the, the hanging piece, just some found work. And it's got a certain charm and, and uh, creepiness <laughs> that I think is just worth a close-up. Gotten a lot of attention. And Edie is the clerk down at the Free Press. Yes, that's right. It's a very colorful piece. This is by Patty Rusky, who um, is just an amazing artist in Mankato, and I think has been a little bit uh, on hiatus. I think she's done some things at, at the Carnegie, but her wife Lisa died a few years ago, and I think that had Patty taking a step back and thinking about, you know, her art in new ways. And she was one of the people who received a free membership from us. Uh, I think it was in March, we were due to send out a whole bunch of renewals, you know, asking people mm. for, for money to renew their memberships. And to myself and to our board of directors, that just felt really distasteful at, at the time. You know, it was like immediately smacking the chaos. And uh, it felt more like we needed to do something for people instead of asking them for money. So we took our list from a couple of years back of people who've been past members during that quarter and we just sent them a free membership for the year. And we said, you know, in a letter something like, you know what, thanks for your support in the past. If it works for you to support us in the future, please do. But for now, um, consider contributing a piece to our membership show and, you know, here's your complimentary membership. Patty was one of those people who hadn't been a member in a few years and we sent her that uh, free membership. And then next thing you know, we get this wonderful piece for the membership show, which is really cool. It is called Task of the Day. And it's six hundred dollars, which you could buy right now. Except Mike knocked the swipe card out of our. <laughs> okay. um, this is another one that really intrigued me. Actually, all of this. Th these are by Cheryl Castine from St. Peter, and they were definitely um, during her quarantine walkarounds. And she played with focus in a way that she didn't even realize at the time, but she acknowledged later. Uh, trying to reference despair and also hope um, and just looking at things in a really new and patient way. And then this one, this fiber piece is Diane Wild, also of St. Peter, who um, I love when she shows up with work for the membership show because she's always trying new things. This one, I don't know how close Mike's focus can get, but um, I asked her about it, what she did, and she said she calls it thread painting. It was just oh. just using thread and then messing with color and all kinds of, I think, different media to get this um, sunset effect. Can we try to go downstairs? Sure. Okay. Please bear with me if you are uh, get sick with movement. You might want to turn away while I go down the stairs. <laughs>
All right, made it safely. Congratulations, welcome to the downstairs. <laughs> and this is where I think you get the full effect of the hundred pieces. You know, the upstairs generally always looks good. I think our lower level looks particularly good when it's just jam packed with artwork. Um, and it definitely is right now. So I'll call your attention to um, this. I think this says a lot about the range of our membership right here. This is another piece by Charlie Putnam. It's called Seasons Greetings, which I think is, oh, Seasons Greetings 2000, no, 2020, which is hilarious because there we are with masks and, and elbow bumping. And again, he'll be the, the solo exhibiting artist for uh, September and October, so you'll see a lot more like this. This is by uh, Oni Eisenberg of St. Peter, who's one of our founding members, and it's hard anger. I can't, I don't know if the right term is embroidery. It's a, it's a kind of fiber art and um, uh, something that she just does because she loves doing it. It's obviously very tedious and intense. So the, the trick was how to display it in a way that, um, you know, could be appreciated, thus the clock. This piece and this collage piece here are by uh, an artist who is new to us. She is a young woman of color in St. Peter who has expressed interest in getting more involved with the Art Center. Uh, I mentioned the magnets before. I think these work with her pieces as well to make the unfinished edges look really intentional. Um, and it was a really interesting process to work with her because it was the first time that she's ever exhibited and um, we loved what she had to say and that she took a risk with her collage work and that's why her work is the is somewhat the centerpiece of what you experience both down here and from upstairs looking down into this part of the gallery. Mm. Um, here's another probably better showcased hard anger piece which I think is Norwegian. Would that be? I probably shouldn't even so. take a risk in saying that. Yeah, so our Norwegian fiber artists in the community will appreciate that. Uh, let's see. And then this was another curatorial decision over here that was affected by the moment that we're in. This is a piece called I Can't Breathe. And um, it's by a white male artist, and we appreciated this, the thought that he put into it and wanted to exhibit it, but also didn't want to make it front and center um, because that's such a question right now that we're grappling with is who, you know, who gets to say what. So uh, we very much wanted to show it, but, but thought um, pretty deeply about how it would fit into the flow. And if you came through the gallery with the directions that we have now put on the floor, you know, for how you have to move. Um, we wanted this, this to be something that was included, but not necessarily like the first thing that you saw, the, the groundwork that got laid uh, as you walked through the rest of it. So hopefully that's been successful. I think the artist feels good about it. Um, yeah, at that. yeah, any questions about anything, Mike? Anything intrigue you? Uh, well, I'll let anybody out there who has, might have questions of Anne. Can you just speak up? I see a lot of people still engaged, but no questions right okay. now. All right. Do you, do you want to talk, Anne, a little bit about, you and I were talking beforehand about kind of the, the history of the Art Center and the fact that uh, you were perhaps uniquely prepared to deal with the pandemic situation. Yeah, I will say that's true. I, I started this job in 2014 and it's not an exaggeration to say that in my first couple years here, not a week went by that someone didn't tell me their tornado story. And I lived in Mankato during the 1998 tornado. And so I kind of, I thought that I understood it, but I've come to realize it was nothing like being a resident of St. Peter, let alone being part of an organization, the Art Center that lost its building had to um, rebuild as an organization and a facility in every way imaginable. Um, it was just incredibly galvanizing. And part of the character uh, of this organization that, that
that, um, you know, without putting it into so many words, that those founders needed to have me understand as, as our legacy. So now, fast forward, here we are during this very unexpected shutdown that has, you know, thrown all kinds of programming off the rails, um, eliminated some funding opportunities, just made the future really uncertain in some ways. And I am all of a sudden so grateful for all that, um, all that history that they imbued me with because it, it has me knowing like the minute this all hit, all I could think was like, well, we're resilient. The art center is resilient. The people, the businesses of St. Peter know how to pivot. We know how to improvise. We'll figure this out. And I really think that's why um, I was able to think quickly about how to do different things, like how to do the radio shows instead of a reception, move our classes online, things like that, and why our board was supportive. Because if you've ever been involved with a small nonprofit or even a big one, you know that's no small thing, you know, to have a board that gets it, that gets the, the culture of the organization and sees the current needs and, and supports, you know, how best to meet them. That's kind of everything. So, and, and they can't just say, oh, we're not going to do anything for a while because that would... Exactly. I think two, two possibilities are like the worst case scenario. One is let's not do anything for a while. And one is just throwing up ideas that aren't really going to have any traction. Like I can't tell you how many people talked about like, just putting the exhibition on Facebook. And I, I get that, I got that sentiment early on, but I also knew that was not something that was gonna be, it didn't fulfill our mission. Or it wasn't like the step back we needed to take to go, all right, how do we actually fulfill our mission in ways that are CDC compliant right now? It's not as easy as the first thing that comes to mind. So our board and my team was just a good combination of taking a step back, but also not missing the opportunities as they came up to, to reinvent. So we eat disasters for breakfast, is what we do in St. Peter. Okay. Where would you like to move to next? You can go up this way and I'll show you the outside that I'm excited about. Oh, okay. Stick with us, folks. Here we go up the stairs now. I think that door closed completely. So we took over the building a year ago, which is going to be really great because we're going to have all these classes in our new space and people in and out like crazy. That can't really happen right now, uh, but we still want to mark the space. So I don't know how much we can back up. Like if you're driving through St. Peter, now you can't miss the back of the art center and the things that we do. And even though the classes aren't happening in there right now, we're still offering all the classes. And I'll show you like, where, where their soul is housed. Even though our writing and fiber instructors are teaching from home, via Zoom. Um, we do have a fiber studio and a writing studio, both of which were really thriving um, right when quarantine began. So we had to abandon them, but I want to say they're kind of like holding the space here for, um, for the disciplines of fiber and writing. This is our writing studio, um, where we were having a monthly writing group and ongoing classes. And what's happening right now for fall is that we're, we're offering several writing classes by Zoom. And what we're seeing is that people are signing up in like geographically distant pairs, like a mother-daughter pair or friends that are across the you know country from each other because uh, it's just, it's like an art date that will keep them connected and I think keep them accountable to doing this new thing which is really fun and it's good for us. Our registration is, is exploding. So in their minds, this is where they're meeting, even though yeah. it's not really happening. This is our really fun, like the room that looks like we got raptured up. Um, the very last weaving class took place, with well, the second to last weaving class took place as we got the order that like we had to close. It was like March 15th or something like that. 
So everything just uh, kind of stopped exactly where it was and no one's been in to, to reorder things. And I kind of like it like a little time capsule. Like this really does look like everything just had to stop. Nobody knew what was gonna happen. Um, like I said, potentially we all got raptured up. So someday when we're, we will be back to using this space, um, in the meantime, we're looking at using it or like allowing a couple of artists in the same household to be the sole users of this space. It's not at all what we intended for it initially, but it would be better in my mind than having it unused. And in particular, we're reaching out to the Somali community in St. Peter um, to see if any of those women would like access to the space uh, because we know there's desire and that they don't have those tools and materials at home. So. Okay. Any questions about this? Any fiber artists in our group? No, I think we've got, Tom's got an open mic and I don't think, I don't see him at the camera. So <laughs> I wonder. Okay. I thought I would close the account. Yeah. I think that's Mickey he's talking to his wife. mention um thing that's i don't know if i would say it's been reinvented but it's something new this year that's going well i don't know if you're I'll, um so we have had for about five years we've had a summer jazz series here in the art center and it's been four concerts may through august once a month down in the lower gallery and we get about between 30 and 50 people there and it's very a very um attentive environment. The musicians love it because people are really paying attention. The music lovers love it because it's not a bar that they have to, you know, hope they can hear as people are talking. Um, so, you know, the city of St. Peter built a new pavilion and it was finished in time for Rock Band Folk Festival last year. And then the city asked us if we could help come up with programming that would bring people to, uh, to the pavilion for live music throughout the summer. So we thought pre-pandemic how perfect we will move our jazz series there and then we will grow it like crazy and will become this huge attraction this summer long thing uh, for jazz musicians well uh, that kind of is and is not happening we are holding the concerts we've had three of the four so far in the pavilion our uh, our promotions have not emphasized uh, you know drawing big crowds what they've emphasized is that it needs to be a small crowd, which fortunately we were only attracting 30 or so people before. So we're attracting small crowds, like 150, 200 people. Um, we have it marked off in the, inside the pavilion where you can, you can sit, bring your own seating. So it's, it's marked off so that you're all sitting at a social distance. The sound carries out into the park. So some of those 150, 200 people are out in the park with their own seating, uh, but they can hear beautifully. It's bring your own refreshments. People are doing that. Uh, Patrick's is also there selling some beverages, but for the most part, people arrive and experience it in a very self-contained way. They're, um, they're, they're feeling social. It's like a reason to get dressed up, sort of, um, see other people, and yet there is no threat of, of being in an enclosed space, uh, you know, on top of each other. Um, so it, it turns out that it was really the perfect year for us to move to the park because we are not yet, our jazz series is not yet the kind of huge thing that would have to be shut down because we weren't fearing crowds of a thousand. Um, and it's kind of the only thing going on. So I think it might be making a whole lot of new jazz fans or fans of live music in general. Uh, the crowds are still attentive. They're, you know, even though they're spaced out and socializing, they're, they're applauding after solos, which is how you know a jazz crowd is paying attention. Um, and, I, and I'm hopeful that next year, even if things are more normal, we'll do the same thing again. And maybe some people who wouldn't have experienced a jazz series, you know, if not for the weirdness of this year, will come back and be part of it. So it might be like the best thing that ever happened 
to our live music program. And we, we made it free when it was here at the Art Center. It was $10 at the door and we gave the musicians a cut of the door. Well, because it's outdoors, we decided to make it free and just take a risk with donations. And donations have been wonderful. People have thrown at least 500 bucks per show in the cash box collectively, you know, which has allowed us to pay the musicians at least $100 a musician. So that's felt great and it's working out and we're grateful for everybody's patience and, and um, willingness to experiment and to do it in the gallery and at the jazz shows and in our classes to do it in such a safe way. And it really has us feeling like we're on track with backing up from what we used to do, but being determined to fulfill our mission and believing that we can fulfill our mission in these new ways. And it feels like so far so good. All right. Anybody have questions? Deb, I know you had provided me with a few. They're in my pocket. I can't necessarily get to them, but uh, you had something about collaboration and partnerships, I believe. Yeah, I think actually um, some of the answers already wove through. I, I want to say that I've been interested in how you talk about setting up shows. For instance, the voice of a white person speaking a black person's message and how you made that work to everyone's okay. And then um, the collaboration for promotion, you mentioned the radio thing. I thought that was interesting. And how you're working with the city to use the park pavilion. Um, the third thing was about the history of the building. What was it originally? Did you say and I missed it or? No, that's a good question. It's been a lot of different things. Like I think it was a pizza place. It was a gas company. Um, frankly, it was one of the very few downtown spaces available after the tornado, which is how it became art center number two, you know, it, meaning number one was in at the old school building out by the community center and that was lost in, in the storm. So this building has been a lot of different things, which is why it's kind of a wonky space. It's, it's um, not what you would do if you were building a gallery from scratch. Uh, that upstairs space was occupied by, um, by a couple renters, a, a principal financial and another business for most of the life of the art center here. But then they decided to move out last year to get a ground level space so that their, their clients could have, you know, not those ridiculous stairs. So this is the first time, this is the first full year that we've occupied the building ourselves, which again is kind of funny because we're, we're ready. I think we had the people ready to bring in and, and make it really lively, but, um, but we're sticking with sole ownership and we're gonna find ways to make it work because it feels, it feels like some kind of full cycle to have, or full circle or something like that, to have the organization own, own and fully use its own building again. Do you want to talk at all about uh, your own personal experience, what you brought to the position of executive position? director? Well, right now I'd say I'm really proud of the live music piece because that was something I, I think I was hired for in part was to figure out, I mean, I'm a musician and so to figure out how to make that a, a, a regular part of, um, of life at the Art Center. And like I said, that lower gallery felt great for a while, but man, the, the potential of the pavilion feels huge to me, like to be a partner with the city in that way. Um, you know, as I look five, 10 years out, I think there's no reason the art center couldn't have, with that and our capacity for recording and then broadcasting things, I just feel like we can be like, a, oh, what's that like big top Chautauqua, like some, mm. something like that, where it's like, this small, maybe unexpected place where this really amazing quality music happens. And then it's got this life in broadcast after that. So, um, you know, that's way beyond my own network as a little bar band performer. <laughs> but I think that's why I have those visions of, of what this could all become in partnership with local musicians and with the city and with KMSU. All right. Yeah. Any other questions? Mary, you always have a question sitting there behind your steering wheel. But you are muted. Uh, right now, I'm not thinking of anything. You're on the main drag on 169, is that correct? 
Yep, yep, yep. Okay. If you're coming from Mankato, it's right after the embassy and right before River Rock. And okay. now you can see with our windows, you can't miss it. You'll be driving and be forced to look up and think, why am I so compelled to think about writing right now? <laughs> Anybody else? What What do you see as the uh, the post pandemic future for for the Arts Center of St. Peter? You know, I'm really hopeful that the changes we had to put in place because of not being able to gather are permanent, like that they feel sustainable on a permanent level, like only having performances in the summer in the pavilion only having or mostly having our writing and fiber classes on Zoom. So my, my hope is that what that does is those just become, um, they become something that feels like the right way to do it and it's what people want, which in a sense like doubles us because then it frees up those spaces that were previously for classes and performance to do something else. And I am really liking the idea of, um, frankly, like our Somali, the Somali women in our community who were just beginning to learn to sew with us. We were doing these monthly or a couple times a month classes to teach them how to sew because we knew that they had expressed a desire for that. We have seamstresses in our volunteer, you know, so it was this great partnership. Then that all got shut down because of quarantine. So I have this vision that that community would become the regular users of our fiber studio um, for their own more practical hands-on sewing and mending projects. Um, and I would love that if kind of our, our longtime loyal constituency stayed connected in, in the new ways that we're putting in place, but that this, this new group of people will feel comfortable making this their like a creative and productive home in a way that would not have opened up if not for all this craziness. A pandemic pivot. Yeah, pandemic pivot. Yeah. All right. Any other questions from the folks in the gallery? Um, I heard you mention that um, the Treaty Center at one time. So are you connected with the Treaty Center? Only in that the executive director and I are close, you know, professional allies. Uh, the Arts and Heritage Council was at one time one organization. And when they lost the building in the tornado, that was also part of the organizational, like, rebuilding and rebirth was that they split off and the art center became the art center. And so the treaty site is no longer formally associated with us, but it's been where we've held our holiday fair for the past few years because the space is wonderful. It brought a great crowd through their exhibitions. So we're just partners informally. Okay. All right. Anything else? I have a question, just maybe a reminder of how to learn about coming to visit this exhibit. Oh, yeah. Um, on our Facebook and our artscentersp.org, um, I try to keep all the information front and center, like our hours. We're open five days a week. Um, masks are required, but that's, of course, the case everywhere right now. Uh, it's wheelchair accessible, except for the, you know, the second, uh, the third floor, rather, the top floor. Um, and we've asked that groups of, I want to say six or more, make advanced reservations to visit the gallery. That's only happened a couple times in the past couple months. It's worked very well. Then the docent can lock the door and put a sign out to just allow that group um, to move around in here knowing that nobody else is going to come in and so they can have all the space that they need to social distance. Uh, but really, like I was saying before, the art center has never been a place where it's dense, you're on top of each other, you're touching people, you're, you know, consuming food or anything like that. So it frankly works very well for safe, the feeling of safety, I think, um, visiting during this era. So we have no plans to shut down again unless we are, you know, forced to, like, like if retail has to close again. Um, our plan is to be to be open with this new arrangement of things, a slightly different flow of things in the gallery, signage about social distance and masks. And um, we have our exhibitions booked out until I want to say mid 2022. 
Um, that's shifting somewhat as different artists will pull out because, you know, for various COVID related reasons, they can't get something done or they want to wait till they can have a reception or something like that. But, um, you know, what with knowing how to pivot, we're, we're planning on just being continuously open um, until the CDC says otherwise. All right. If there is nothing else, uh, let's all give a, a silent thank you to, to Anne for spending part of her afternoon with us. This, they are closed today, which is why it worked out to be a good day for us to come here. So we appreciate you all coming. And if you have not, well, if you haven't done so yet, we're about to shut down. But if you haven't signed in, you can send me an email and maybe we can take care of it that way. But I think most of you are probably all set. So with that being said, Thank you very much for coming today. And I'll give you one last look at me. I am still in my mask. So uh, thank you all very much. And thank you, Deb. Uh, have yourself a great day.